Hey, this is Ryan with School of Motion. Today's video is really interesting. I recently had a chance to sit down with Greg Stewart and take a tour of some of his latest projects. In this video, Greg covers how he approaches storyboarding, animation, working with client feedback, and his time spent with some of the top talent in the industry, along with what it's like to direct motion design teams. This is actually a new type of video for School of Motion. The goal is to have this feel like a tutorial and an interview at the same time. So let's get to it. First things first, uh, Greg, do you want to say hello? Yeah, hey, I'm uh, Greg Stewart. I'm a School of Motion alumni. I did an animation boot camp two years ago, design boot camp, and looking forward to many more courses. What, what is this first piece that you have here? Yeah, so this piece is, uh, is a promotional video for a uh, missions conference called Cross Conference. So this was a project where I was direct to client. So I was sort of sitting in a director and producer chair. Um, I'd worked with the clients before on a different piece for a different conference that they put on. So um, this was kind of my first really big piece since stepping out into the freelance world and not just being handed boards and animating, but getting to be in on the client conversations and talk through what is the story that you guys want to tell with this piece and what's what's your goal? Who are you speaking to? Do you have a theme in mind? So I got to be part of like from start to finish writing the script, coming up with a concept. Um, I worked on this uh, with a friend of mine named Bradley Wakefield. He's a just a really talented designer and a great guy. We have a little partnership. We work on stuff every once in a while. Okay. Uh, he's full-time remote with like a mortgage company or something doing design. So, um, and is in a way that I really admire, just a very balanced person and prioritizes family. So opportunities are... Um, select <laughs> okay. but um yeah so he kind of led the charge on all like the visual language and design and we really worked together on that but in terms of like the art direction that was all him but um so it was really fun to work on this like with him and we had a couple other school of motion alumni work on the animation so it was really fun for me just as like a challenge to go from mostly just animating things to kind of more creative directing so what do you mean by like big project? Like what does that mean? Yeah. So um, I think like big in terms of the role um, that I was playing and then just it being like, this isn't just like a logo animation. This is a two minute piece. They really wanted to promote this on Facebook and, you know, some of the speakers at this conference have hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter. And so they really wanted this to be, good um so it was just yeah just super kind of just like a fun challenge for me to um start at the very beginning of the process and then um work from from there to the finish so so once once we had the script um just because i was juggling a couple projects at this time i sort of figured the best way to kind of set up my other animators for success was for me to animate like a chunk of it and then to pass off that project mm -hmm. file mm -hmm. and kind of have a conversation with them about, um, you know, here's here's this bit I've animated, here is kind of the feel that I want for this, given like the goal, and like the goal of this project was to challenge um, people, so this is for a conference for Christians, a challenge, challenge 18 to 25 year olds to just really think about how seriously committed they are to their faith. And I think there's things about that that would translate outside of just that world. But um, so for Radley and I, as we were thinking through this, we really wanted to capture like a sense of beauty with that okay. and to feel like, you know, if you're really giving your all to this, there's um, hard things about that, but there's really wonderful global things that can come with that as well. And this conference is sort of aimed at getting people um, out of like from the Christian world to, to go overseas and to put themselves in really challenging situations. And so trying to just associate like color and, and vibrance and, and beauty with that. Um, and so a lot of like the handmade kind of like we exported this at 12 frame or posterized at 12 frames a second and had some like wiggles on a lot of like little things just to try and get it to feel not too techy, but sort of handmade. Okay. Um, and then kind of like longer drawn out, smoother, elegant movements to yeah. try and like Ah, oh, that feels nice. <laughs> that feels nice. I think is, on this frame, I mean, that you're yeah. definitely pulling in that hand, uh, handmade kind of look. Uh, and yeah. it's interesting that you put it out at 12 frames per second to kind of 
uh, give it that aesthetic. Um, and what you said just a minute ago was uh, really interesting is that you animated a chunk of it before yeah. you sent it to the rest of your team. And I remember um, I was reading through the animator survival kit oh, sure. uh, and uh, he was talking about the process of like, you would make the keyframes for the junior animators totally. and then uh, they would go based off of that and then you would critique their work to try to make it smooth yeah. and stuff. So it's kind of interesting to see like you're, you're bringing in uh, old, almost old school tactics, you know, yeah. into a modern animation yeah. uh, time. Yeah, so that was super, I mean, I think like part of the fun thing for me about being more in like the director, producer, senior person in this role was that I could <laughs> selfishly just sort of pick the parts that I really wanted to do. Um, so as part of this, I wanted to experiment with doing some like frame by frame stuff in Photoshop. And so I um, did a couple like just frame by frame hand drawn transition. So like as these text bits are coming in, you know, those are all like totally custom frame by frame hand painted transitions that I made in Photoshop simply because I just wanted to try something new. Okay. And so because I assigned myself that role, I got to do that. So you wanted to try something new yeah. and uh, but did you, like, did you just like instantly know, like I want to try something new and I know I want to try this or did you kind of like do some research and development to figure out like, what is this text? How should it come on? And like, what's kind of a best practice for that? Or? Um, no, honestly, it's something I've been sort of noodling on for a while. Like, oh, I think it'd be cool to, I think it could bring like another level um, like having that in my my skill set or just being able to do that would give me some more options and like mm -hmm. another thing in my mm -hmm. toolkit for mm -hmm. motion design. Um, and just from an efficiency standpoint, I mean, this whole thing, we animated it, I, I want to say in like two weeks. Man. Um, you know, and that was with me working on a couple things and Francisco and Kenji, the other animators, also working on a couple things. So um, just from the get go, I had to think about how do we do this really well, but also really efficiently. And so my thought was if I make a couple transitions, they can just throw these on everything. And then we have like a, an elegant, interesting, unique way to, I mean, it's a cool thing about that is like nobody else has that exact transition, Yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, there's obviously very similar things. It's, it's not, not just so. a linear wipe yeah. across right. the text and it comes on. <laughs> Radial, or you, just popping on. You had taken the time to draw out each frame to, to make right. that transition happen. Yeah. And that's, that's cool. That's, that's really like takes another level of like ownership over the animation yeah. that you're actually doing. Yeah. And so what was kind of, you know, you, you animated a chunk of it yeah. and then uh, you, um, you handed off like the rest of the animation to, yeah. uh, you know, the rest of the team. Like what was that process like? And maybe talk about some of the things that you learned. Uh, yeah, that. yeah, for sure. So this, this was the chunk I animated just from like that book transition through here. I think this was the, the first chunk I did that I passed off. Okay. Um, so Francisco and Kenji, we kind of onboarded them. Kenji, we brought in a little later in the game when it was like, oh, we really need another, another person. And he just knocked it out of the park, put in some late nights, which I really appreciated. Um, not, not altogether foreign to those of us in this world. Um, so we brought, I knew Francisco and I had kind of been chatting for a while and I was like, I, I really want to get get to work with this guy on something. He's just super talented animator. And I think we have like somewhat similar styles. Um, so I had been onboarding him actually pretty, pretty early on in the process as we were still even writing okay. the script. Um, and just sort of saying, this is generally what we're trying to do with this video as we were doing the frames. Radley like cranked out all these frames like one day, <laughs> just like, just a beast. Um, so I sent him all those and I said like, hey, are there bits of these that or any frames out of here that you get excited about animating or you have energy around doing. And I think like that was one thing I learned was just giving people things that they're excited to do. Um, you can't obviously always be over the moon about everything that you get to do on a project, but I think um, just trying to think of like the skill sets of the people that I've got working with me and how can I give them things that they're going to want to do and have creative energy around. Um, so he kind of saw like the whole thing like from board start to finish. We did like these board matics where we threw all the frames in like Premiere with the voiceover and just timed it out. Okay. Um, and just because we didn't have a ton of time for like rounds of revisions, it was really important to get client approval on like here's the timing and is, does this feel good? Yes. Okay. Then we can go animate it. And you said this is kind of like your first uh, 
go at like, like kind of managing a team, yeah. yeah, with a team and everything. Yeah. And so, uh, can you kind of talk about like how is that different than you being by yourself, especially managing uh, client expectations, yeah. running through boards, and then like casting a vision? Yeah, I mean, man, I think it's way better. I think like this was I maybe was just really lucky to have a great experience doing this on my my first go at it, but. Um, previous to this, I was, um, kind of just like a, not like a one man show cause I was working on teams and, you know, I really don't want to downplay the role that designers that I worked, you know, but in, when it came to the actual execution of the motion, um, I think that my personality is that I just work better when I'm putting more of myself into fewer things mm. than mm. spreading myself too thin. Okay. And so I think just like my mental bandwidth from being able to say, I only have to animate like this this one bit so I can really dive into this. That was really exciting. Um, and then being able to just take that and hand that off to other people and say like, they can take this. And like some of the things Francisco did, like I didn't have in my head, but it was just so cool to be like, oh, like he did this, um, this like 3D, he had sort of seen this kind of like 3D looking book thing. And he was like, oh, I want to do something kind of like that. So this door, th like that was not even I had no idea how we were going to get from this. This was like one of the style frames to this. And so just to like see that, which was not in my head and is like a great idea and executed so well was just like so cool. Man, that's awesome. So he, from here, he, he just added in this door yeah. that closes, but the door was in the frames, yeah. but I, that transition. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. So was, that was super cool. Just be like, oh, I wouldn't, I would never have had that idea. Um, and you came up with that on your own and did it so well. So um, you said that uh, there was another School of Motion alumni working yeah. on this process with you. And one of the things that I feel like I keep seeing is this, there's this little uh, dotted line that's traveling through, yeah. uh, you know, and, and we learn like right here in this scene, uh, there's this dotted line and it's eye tracing. Yeah. You know, it's pulling, it's pulling you across the frame yeah. so that you can uh, uh, guide the viewer uh, right. or be uh, guided as a viewer. Yeah. So. What was it like working with another alumni that you know, hey, you've learned some of these same principles, you've, um, you've gone through some of the same courses and like being yeah. able to have that communication? No, that's great. I think it just sort of, it's like learning any language. Like when you know you have the same foundation of like, we know the same words. So when I say the term I trace or overshoot, like you're going to understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I think it just makes communication a lot easier. Uh, and same with Francisco, like just being able to say, hey, like, I, I think if you have this overshoot by just a couple frames, or I would love for, like, you to just think about, like, you know, f so for instance, this, um, this thing, uh, this here to there, we really wanted, what we wanted this frame to communicate was, like, for people to think, I am at point A in my life, we all have, at least, whether it's fully developed or not, some idea of we want to get somewhere, and the way that Francisco had originally animated this was like these dots were just all kind of changing colors um, as they, and they just all popped on at once. And so because like big picture, our concept is how do we get people to think about I'm here and I'm going there. We don't want these things to be blinking on and off because that doesn't connect with that idea. And so ha giving him the feedback of like, can we have these pop on from left to right and the line travel from literally here to there. Yeah. So we're bringing the person's eye from here to there with the goal of getting that idea in their head. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really neat sort of talking about these techniques and principles, but in the context of big picture ideas and how are we getting people to think and feel. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's really amazing how uh, this line, it's kind of the character of that, you know, this segment um, and, and like you would think like, oh, the, the dots are the prettiest part, but really right. the thing that's driving the animation is a simple line yeah. uh, that's going from here to there, right. <laughs> literally. Um, and so that's, that's really cool that um, yeah. uh, this kind of process that you guys walk through um, for this. So what, what is another, you got some other pieces here for yeah, me yeah, yeah. to kind of look through. So this is a super fun, I'll just play it for now. Um, Piece. I got to animate this with an agency out of LA called Veracity Collab. Collab. Okay. Paul Slemmer works there. Um, this is just a super fun process. So in contrast to the cross piece, um, I was given boards. Um, their designer, Drew, uh, Drew White, was kind of the creative lead on this. And so 
he sent me a bunch of boards and we hopped on this. <laughs> it was such a great experience. We call, we were on a call for probably like a couple hours, like several times. So he kind of walked me through his vision for, um, you know, start to finish. Here's like what we want this piece to do. Um, this is for like a service that does AI bot chat. And so we want this to feel fun and approachable. And so I think just like getting aligned right off the bat of like, what is it you want this to feel like was super helpful. And then um, one thing I just really appreciated about working with their team was they gave me a ton of creative control and input and um, Drew was just, it was just so fun. We'd like throw out these different ideas for how do we want this to transition and you know there were some some things that he had kind of written out in the design storyboard and I was like well I actually think like this might be a cooler way of doing that and he's like totally like have at it. Man so, that's awesome yeah. to be able to even have that opportunity to one like there's just there's a certain scary uh, feeling about like getting boards and like yeah. you have total creative freedom. It's like, oh, give me some yeah. boundaries, you know, and it seems like it's the artistic dream to just get to put your own voice on everything. Totally. But it's cool that you were able to give feedback and work on a process with a client like what you're talking about. Yeah. So it was, that was so much fun. I think like, I mean, just for me, I really, I feel strongly like time, you know, time is something I can't get back. And so I want to spend my creative energy and time working on things that I feel, um, as much as possible, like excited to work on. And for me, challenging myself is something that's really exciting. So taking on things that are kind of maybe one level above where I feel comfortable. Um, and so there is some techniques in this that I really wanted to try. So like these little bots, um, I just did that with a pretty simple like joysticks and sliders rig, but nice. I'd never really used that before or done a ton of like character animation I, this would be pretty simple <laughs> character but yeah. a lot of what i've done is just you know like these like shapey shape smeary things and so like just sort of seeing this bot and in the style frames it was all flat but thinking how can i like add a little bit of life to this guy and make make him feel friendly and you know approachable kind of like with the goal for the project i think this bot definitely i feel like he drives the piece almost like um i I think we you had shared this piece with me a while back, and I was like, man, that robot! Like, I feel like I I heard what the the uh, ad was trying to show and stuff yeah. like that, but like the robot really kept kept me engaged. You know, popping up in frames and like how you know, quote unquote, cute he was yeah. uh, throughout the process. And I, it's it is interesting that you're talking about like this is a simple character compared yeah. to like character rigging and uh, stuff like yeah. that, but. It's really like how you use the character and like the and the character you give right. it that really kind of drives the piece uh, yeah. and and makes it you know seem advanced in a yeah. way. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like something I just like increasingly believe is that um, it's like the things that you feel more than maybe the things that you see and recognize, and mm -hmm. so like you know, having it blink or having the motion path of like the the joystick not be linear, but kind of curve as it's looking from like left to right, it's not going straight, but kind of mm -hmm. curving down a little bit. Like those things make it feel a little bit more alive. And, you know, even though a, the vast majority of people watching that are gonna be like, oh cool, like the, the path isn't linear, you feel that and it feels more alive, even though you yeah. can't necessarily articulate that. Yeah. And I think those details are the ones that are really, I mean, they can be the hardest ones to nail down, but I think they're worth, like, they're just so worth spending all the time on. So were these colors, that, these colors are awesome. Were they part of their branding, uh, branding guidelines or? Yeah, I, th I think they were taken off, like, the, so the client was help shift. I think they were taken off their, their brand guidelines. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so one of the, one of the, like, a couple of my favorite, favorite bits from this was... So like this, this for instance was one of the frames like this here, and you know this was maybe the, this was maybe the frame before that. Oh, that's funny that things get thing gets cut off there. Whoops. Um, <laughs> can't be funny. perfect. So maybe this was the frame before, uh, and like this was the frame before that. So just, I think like honestly sometimes when I have boards given to me, the way I just like get thinking about transitions rather than just like hopping into After Effects is literally just staring at them and like circling things or shapes that are similar between okay. like frame one and frame two. So seeing like, okay, here we've got three shapes that are smeared and they are circular and they're moving down. And then in, you know, this frame we have like, there's these three circles. So like, okay, that's maybe like 
a starting point for what I want to have transition into what. Um, now I know this is like a like a very detailed question, but like, yeah. did you print off these frames on paper and like yep, work on them? 100%. Okay, that's yep. interesting. So you didn't like pull an iPad, like you just old school like printed it out yeah. and started drawing yeah. up on it. Well, I think sometimes it's just helpful to get away from a computer because okay. I think like if I'm thinking about this in After Effects, I'm thinking about this like these things with the limitation of like, well, can I do that with this effect or that effect? Mm. Versus if I'm kind of taking a step back from that. Mm and just looking on paper, I feel like there's less constraints. And I think like so much of the creative process is funneling in and getting focused as you move forward. I think in the podcasts that I listen to with other like really high-end animators, I feel like I constantly hear like, stop thinking what I can do in After Effects. Yeah. Just think about like, how can I, anim like how can I bring this to life? Like what are the totally. ways that I, I want to animate this? Not like what are the limitations of After Effects and what yeah. effect can I add to it? Well, and I think like something I'm learning as I've, um, just like been privileged to work with some pretty sweet people and like get get better work is just that like so much of making good stuff is 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 just that it's like the problem solving of like how do I get After Effects to do this thing that it maybe it doesn't wasn't designed to do yeah. or because of the concept or the feeling that we want to communicate with this piece I need this to move in this way or I need this to do this thing that is sort of impossible but how can I figure out a way to do that? Right. Whether that's cutting or some janky expressions or, or whatever. It's amazing. Like I, just a really quick touch on the yeah. cutting part. Like it's amazing how much I did not use cutting, you know, yeah. to transition between things in After Effects when it seems like it's a simple video editing thing to, to use, yeah. but um, I'm always like wanting to morph things, you know, yeah. or whatever. Uh, yeah. And so like, Sometimes I think our limitation is just thinking like, what are the tools that I do have that I can get the effect I want? Yeah. And cutting is one of those. That's things. such a great tool. Yeah, like this. Um, this is maybe a super like. I mean, that's a cut. Yeah. But like when I was working with Jorge in Vancouver, he would like go through and be like, I don't like how this frame looks. And I was like, Wow, like you really have to, you know. So I was. I think I was maybe expecting feedback to be like, Oh, the curve isn't right. But it'd be like this frame. This is a frame that bothers me because of the size of those dots. But so I was going back out, change it. But I think like honestly, cuts are just even from a, like a workflow logistical standpoint, like it's just so helpful. Because <laughs> if you have everything morphed and keyframed, and you have to go back and shift the timing, and this is a piece where we did have to shift the timing around a little bit because um, of some stuff with the voiceover, like you are like it, you are just really shooting yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. um, and so having like this cut. It's like, well, I just need to maybe draw out the end of this a little bit, and then like we're good to go from there. I don't have to redo this whole complex morph thing, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, so even like the transition from like I, th I think somewhere like this was maybe the frame, but probably not with those dots kind of overlapping. But um, so like maybe that was frame two or whatever, and this was the second frame. Um, you know, kind of like the Drew's vision for this was that like this would feel like a rotary phone. So this mm. ring around mm -hmm. the edge is kind of like moving around. And so part of that was like, oh, well, maybe like to try and connect those things, we should like zoom into a phone. But then also just looking at the frames and seeing this frame has a circle in the middle and this frame has a circle in the middle, like, boom. You know, yeah, there's and, a, and in my eye, it's like, oh, that turned into that, you know, yeah. and but really they're not even that close. As yeah. far as it's just like I, my brain automatically connect the dots. That was a circle. This is a circle. Yeah. And I think too, like it's so important as you're working on stuff to watch things in chunks. And not, I think you're so often working like frame, not necessarily like literally frame by frame, but you're working like these tiny little like one second things. And I think to like export and watch 10 seconds and then get a feel for, oh, like this is moving way too fast mm -hmm. or... Um, because, yeah, I think that, like, subconsciously you think, oh, that morphed into that, even though that's really not at all what happened. Um, you know, in the beginning here in this pro in this uh, project, uh, there's not a lot of color yeah. uh, in it. Uh, you're, it. This is kind of like, I guess it's like a gray or like a, uh, like a really, really light navy blue. Um, this, like, you haven't introduced any color. What was, was there any challenge to, like, balancing the artwork uh, before you could bring in these other, like, uh, accents? Um... I mean, not really. I don't know if that was like a intentional thing on, on Drew's end as he was like thinking about this. I think I could definitely see that. Um, I mean, I think like honestly, one of his things that he said right up front was like, we just really intentionally have kept the design on this minimal because we want to really lean into the motion on this. And so, mm. um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of like the challenge for me on this front end was like, how do I? I think I, as a motion designer, always feel the burden to like things got to keep moving. We got to have interest. Like nothing should ever be still. Mm. Uh, you always have to remember that like this isn't for other motion designers. Ultimately, like this is for like product managers or something, and they're not going to be like, oh, why is this thing still? <laughs> yeah. If anything, it's going to be like, well, why is it moving so much? I don't get it. <laughs> um, and so always having that in the back of your head, I think, is uh, is helpful. Um, so, I mean, cadence is like a thing that you just don't. It, it takes a while to kind of develop. Yeah. You have to like put in, you know, reviews for your rough drafts of animation and, and client feedback. And then eventually you like gain like that understanding and that to be able to put your own voice in the work, uh, but also have a cadence that's, you know, uh, there for the viewers. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that was that was kind of a f my first pass at this like opening chunk was just like insane. There was just way too much happening. And Drew was like, oh, this is cool. I think we need to tone it down. And I was like dang it but um but that's good you at least yeah. you have you know like the hard thing is like well i did spend more time on it but at the same time like i can scale it back instead of like this is not enough totally. you know so i guess like <laughs> on the imposter syndrome you know part of our brain that that actually feels better you know uh, yeah. in some weird way <laughs> well i mean i feel like man i just i it's so rough drafts are so hard for me I, like i'm just such a perfectionist and i think especially like this is my first project working with them i really wanted to impress them and so it was like well, I don't want to, sh I want to show them something that looks good, not some, you know, like little rough draft that looks bad. Yeah. And then, you know, and of course they have feedback and then it's like, oh, dang it. Like they didn't like it, or, <laughs> which wasn't at all the case. But I think like, yeah, it's so easy for me to just like, I think try and compensate for that imposter syndrome by, um, you know, putting maybe a little bit too much in on the front end. But then like the bummer for me is that then it takes a way more effort to fix to make those adjustments because i've keyframed all these things and felt all this time on the curves and then it's like well you know we need this to be less crazy <laughs> kind of just have to start over and that's where um yeah. really getting into the the uh, mindset of doing animatics you yeah. know building out storyboards and stuff like yeah. that and like the communication that you uh, really kind of, it's it's almost, uh, if you want to advance as a motion designer, you know, in your career, you really want to learn yeah. that process of yeah. being able to communicate what your ideas are so that when you're in the edit, you know, you know, okay, this isn't like the prettiest thing, but I'm showing them like, this is the basic movement. This is what's going to go from here to here. I'm going to make it prettier totally. later, you know? Yeah. I think process is, I don't want to say it's everything. I think it's just really important and not for the sake of process, but I think like good process gives you bandwidth to have creative freedom mm -hmm. later on in the like because if you just jump in and you you know i'm going to design this whole thing in after effects and just start animating it i think one because you're in your animation software and you're designing you're just thinking about things differently and i think you're going to miss out on different ideas that you mm -hmm. might have had otherwise um but i think that like process is something that shouldn't be well i have to do this animatic this way because every project's a little different but I do think that like, you know, for instance, having margin so that if something comes up a week before the deadline, you've already got the thing finished rather than you're pushing it like the very last minute, it's just like less stressful and you're, you're building in capacity to incorporate some of the shifts that are going to happen or the client ideas that you might really hate, but you know, you're serving them. And so you have to listen to that. Um, so yeah, I think process, like developing your own process and something that works for you and, and also works for the client, I think is just really important. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. Um, and, and a lot of times it's like, you really just need to get the full piece done because like the, I, when I first started, the hardest thing to do is to stop touching all the little details. Yeah. And then we would get to the last two days, you know, and I'm like, I still have, you know, 50% of this project to finish and I didn't build a baseline foundation yeah. or the project, yeah. you know, that's really, I like, I like what you just yeah. said. Well, and especially with clients who haven't been through a process like this before, I think I'm, I found that sometimes they just don't really know how to react until they see a, like an animated video. Mm. Cause you send them a bunch of style frames and it's sort of like, well, what am I looking at? Yeah. That's interesting. Um, but I think for your own interest, like putting in that work on the front end to really sit with them and explain, you know, this is what you're looking at. Um, this is, you know, here's frame one, here's frame two. Here's kind of maybe how this might move so that when they see a rough draft, like they're not like overwhelmed and want to change a million things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I think too, just like really putting in the work to understand what is it that they're trying to communicate? Because I think, 
I think I just said this, but like ultimately a lot of our work is not for other motion designers. And so making work that people are going to connect with, you have to constantly be thinking, like asking yourself, why is this moving this way? And is this connected to a bigger mm -hmm. idea? I think that was something I really learned um, at the agency I was at before I was freelance open book. Um, just like stupidly talented people there. But I like, I'd never been asked, like told, like, I don't get it. Or why did it, move this way or like <laughs> I remember it was like one of my first projects there I was working on this thing it was starting off like over a map of New York and like this dot moving and my boss was like why is it moving in the East River and it was just sort of it became kind of like a running joke but I was like That's so funny honestly I don't have an answer for like I don't know <laughs> and so I think yeah just like that's something I was really grateful for from from learning there was that I was constantly pushed to like think like ask myself why and there's two ways you could have gone with that feedback. You could have been like, well, you're, you're dumb. Of course, like I'm moving it because it, it makes it more interesting. But yeah. at the other point, like you also have the viewer like who's curious, like I'm distracted by this dot, yeah. you know, and like really kind of like balancing out what that is. Uh, and I, I, I took theater in uh, oh, high sure. school. And one of the things that you, whenever you made a movement across the stage or an advancement on something, there had to be a reason for it. Totally. You didn't just throw your hands up in the air randomly because people would be like, what, what was that? You know? Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. like there was, you had to have intention in it. And I think that is something that, uh, you know, not everybody's gone through uh, theatrical, sure. you know, whatever classes or yeah. anything like that. But that's something that definitely kind of sticks into my motion design really? thought process yeah. is like, yeah. there's a reason for it. You know, it needs to be, and, uh, and sometimes you kind of lose sight of that until someone else says like, I don't understand why you're right. doing that, you know. Well, and like, because it looks cool might be a good enough reason for another motion designer. Yeah. But, you know, if you're working on a video for fundraisers and you're targeting wealthy CEOs, like, they they don't have, like, they don't care <laughs> about, like, what's cool, you know. No, yeah. They want to know statistics or they want to feel compelled in some way. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, anyways, that's all kind of a side note. But, um yeah, I think one of my other my other favorite transitions that just sort of came um, as I was animating, like I think to back to the thing about process, I think like some of the best ideas that I've had have come as I've been working and not on the front end. And so I think mm. like trying to strike that balance between not holding myself too tightly to a script um, and having like time and margin to explore things. So like this whole. I think that, um, you know, in terms of like the, the board I was given, like this was maybe a frame and uh, what was it like just before this? Um, this was a frame like where it gets like split into three pieces. Mm. And then the next thing was just this. So there wasn't, Drew and I kind of went back and forth about like, how do we transition? And like the thing <laughs> that I, like how I sort of came up with this was like, well, there's three pieces here. And there's three things here. They're kind of following their own little bin. Yeah. Basically. And yeah. ultimately, I didn't want, I think sometimes if you're, it's really obvious if a transition is forced and, you know, you're trying like too hard to connect things in one frame to another. So having these two fall out of frame and then kind of you're able to follow this one. And anyway, like I'm not, you know, the point of this isn't to morph this quarter circle into this little like slider as much like how can I give something like someone's something to actually follow as there is like this transition is happening yeah the drop of that slider like that that continues that motion you know right. like we talked about earlier the eye tracing yep. and one thing like I think that we should definitely kind of point out is like before this drops in like the two pieces on the left they drop down but their rectangles don't come up first because the last quarter that's on the screen still uh, is is where your eye is at now right. you're following that and so that first or the right side rectangle catches it first yeah. and that's like it's like a, such a small detail but if you would have had that quarter on the right side dropping down and then totally. the rectangle on the left jump up then that would like compete for iframe uh, like, oh no sorry an iframe yeah. that would compete for your eye tracing to where yeah. then people might miss the slider you know dropping down yeah. to continue that motion exactly yeah and I think I mean I had sort of experimented with that and I think like the perfectionist brain in me is like, well, this doesn't literally make sense because of course the ones on the left would come up first, but ultimately like the priority isn't necessarily making things that literally follow mm. the rules of whatever yeah. as much as like for whoever's watching this, you don't want to overwhelm them. Like you want to make sure that they're able to follow 
what's happening or they're going to be distracted. Like the motion should be something that serves to communicate the concept and the message of the piece, not something that distracts from it. And Absolutely. so if you overdo it, you're going to distract from it. And then that should just be a quote. Like <laughs> that should be a quote and we'll, and, and just like a, a print out and put it on your wall. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's so important. And then this was one of my other favorite transitions. Like, um, I feel weird talking about like my favorite bits of my own work, but um, so this, I mean, this was generally like, you know, frame, we'll call it frame B and this was frame A. And I think the initial idea was to sort of have everything like collapse into the middle and then this calendar comes out. And I think as I was, I was just like toggling back and forth between this and this, I was like, well, man, like there's all these like, you know, I'm looking at these three kind of squares in the middle here and thinking like oh there's like those lines there and those lines there mm -hmm. and you know rather than having everything kind of like collapse and then reappear which might be one of those things where it could be a really interesting transition but it's just too much happening okay like is there a way that you know and granted these three shapes aren't squares but is there a way that i could just kind of pop out of that into yeah. this and it like technically wasn't a crazy difficult thing to execute. I mean, it was a matter of, I think like these three, you know, solids or shape layers or whatever, all just like parented to a null and it scales down so they become squares. And then the rest of these are, uh, and I had tried a couple iterations where all these other squares were like moving in, and it was just, it was just too much. Man, and this really, this move specifically gives the piece a lot of depth, you know, yeah. and, which is really hard to do when you're working with 2D, you know, design, yeah. uh, giving your piece like it's not just sliding left and right all the right. time, you know, but being able to use uh, the, uh, basically a, a pull out, you know, in, yeah. a, in a way. Yeah, and so I think like, you know, having it anticipate in a little bit, you know, like, so you've got the edges mm -hmm. of that yellow or now blue, like moving in that sort of helped kick it off. And then the other thing that I sort of enjoyed was all these sliders move down and then you have a, the contrasting motion of like the, mm -hmm. the dots coming Ooh, up. Droplet or something. Yeah. Like and so yeah. like that just feels satisfying because it's kind of like, it goes like, boop. <laughs> not that's going to translate, but like yeah. it comes and that's like, that's a, an extra element that just sort of helps sell that and like I think the most rewarding thing is just to watch something like oh that cool that like feels that really feels good. nice yeah, yeah. and I, I was thinking about what you said a while ago it's like this is my favorite transition and really I think what you're saying is like I found a lot of delight in yeah. animating this and like at the end of it I was proud of it yeah. you know and, and Ooh, an there, there are those little pieces yeah. that are like you know and sometimes they're just like happenstance that they just you know they're there you know yeah. and like you you might have even applied the wrong effect sometimes totally. and then okay. that gave yeah. you an idea yeah or even like this moment too like this was a yeah you know a thing where they this was like the frame and it was sort of the direction was the bot kind of goes down in and i you know even like having it blink beforehand i think like for some yeah. reason just kind of makes it i love like, how he's got a little curved you know it's just like a small detail like his little eye blinks are curved you know yeah. it makes him a little happier yeah <laughs> um you know this whole like squares expanding thing like that wasn't in the style frame i was just like well i feel like just having all these uh, i forgot to mat him gosh <laughs> so many things but you know what again like that's something that like kind of didn't even matter in yeah. this case like i didn't even notice it and i, I feel like my eye has trained pretty decently over yeah, over totally. the years of working in this you know that i can catch those kind of things yeah. but it happens so fast you know right yeah. Um, so this was fun because like thinking, okay, the point of impact is here and, um, you know, and it's like, like the, the technical, like the behind of this is like not, it's not sexy at all. It was literally just like I took a bunch of solids and I sequenced them out from this point on the screen, like expanding outwards. And in retrospect, I know there's a script that'll like do that from the center and I probably could have just done that and then moved mm. that whole thing over. But, and then, you know, like having all these, some of, some of the mouths on a couple of these like heads are moving and opening. And mm -hmm. again, like enough to add a subtle amount of detail, but not so much as to be overwhelming. You know, so here's like another hard cut. And that was just like, mm. there's no way I'm going to like morph this into Sometimes it's just like lazy, but I don't think that's always like working smart and working lazy or mm -hmm. sometimes hard to tell the difference between. But this was this was a fun little sequence too. Um, yeah, that's smooth. 
I think, I mean, it was, this was very inspired by Jordan Scott. I think that Google UX. Love Jordan Scott's work. Yeah. I mean, Drew just like literally, he's like, just do, basically do something like this. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, like a lot of people, uh, I hope this isn't like weird to say, but like really loved this transition. And I was just kind of like, I don't like, <laughs> I just tried to make that big white thing somehow become an eye. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think like it's it's hard to it's sometimes weird to critique your own work, but like this is a transition that I think like I felt sort of like this is lazy, like mm. just literally taking. I mean, if this is you know frame A, this is frame B. I feel like I kind of just took like the shortest, <laughs> like well, I'm just gonna round round the corners on them, adjust the paths a little bit so they become circles, and move stuff into place. And I think like sometimes that's okay. Like you don't always have to do the most complicated thing um you know and like i don't know that's how, like you, not everything yeah. has to be insane you know and the and detail in here that i think is important uh to, to, as far as like continuity and like how things actually work the the specular highlight in this eye that little yellow dot yeah. um it actually stays in the top left corner like that's you know it wouldn't it wouldn't guide itself like the robot kind of does its, right. its its face and stuff like that which might make it look awkward like it's not even a human eye in right. a sense um but you kept it up there, you know, thinking about like, and I don't know if that's just like over time, you've just, you, you observe how things work or just yeah. like, uh, you know, improving artistic vision or anything right. like that. Honestly, like I, I wasn't really, I tried to find like, <laughs> I think for this, I actually spent quite a bit of time trying to find like eye references because I was like, what, like, because this is obviously a reflection, like this yellow dot is mm -hmm. a reflection. It's not part of the eye, so it's not going to move with it, but yeah. how is it going to move? But I couldn't find, so I eventually was like, I think this feels okay. Um, that is so funny. But yeah, I mean, I think like something that's really hard to do well is to imitate real things. Mm. It's one thing when you're, you know, like taking a square and move, I mean, you can move it however you want, but when you're doing something that like, because I think people maybe don't have a list of rules, but they they just know when something doesn't feel right. That's like an eye or a yeah. hand. It's like, oh, that doesn't look We observe right. it every single day. Yeah, you know. so you know. Like, you, yeah. you can call BS on that. But, so I think that's like, so those are some of the hardest things to, to pull off. But So you have another piece you actually wanted to show yeah, me. Yeah, and yeah. this one's really exciting because um, mm -hmm. you you got to work with uh, Jorge. Yeah. Uh, um, and I'm not sure exactly how to say his last name. How do you? Uh, well, it's... Estrada is, I think he, his like last name is, they go by Canedo. Canedo. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's Jorge Rolando Canedo Estrada. Okay. <laughs> which I forget, we were talking about, because I also have four names, um, but we were talking about like the meaning of names over lunch. I think like his last two names mean street dog or something. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Something uh, farmer something, I'll so, have to ask him. But, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this was a super, super fun piece to work on. Um, it's kind of an animated explainer video for a ministry called The Bible Project, okay. uh, explaining, attempting to explain the Trinity, which is a sort of Christian doctrine that um, there's one God, but he has sort of three persons, but okay. it's one God. Mm -hmm. So outside of that <laughs> bubble or world, it might be kind of weird. But um, and This is your first time working with Jorge, right? Uh, in person, yeah. I had worked on one, um, just like a couple shots from a piece with him in... Uh, maybe like a month before this. Um, so this is a long, this is like almost an eight minute piece. So it was Jorge and uh, Victor Silva. Both, I mean, both of those guys, I just like, they are so like just nice people and also just like stupidly talented. Oh, I think like as some coming out of being self-taught, being kind of like the motion designer at my other places of employment or being, you know, like solo freelance, just like getting to sit next to people and be like, oh, that's, that's how you do that or oh like why don't you try it this way or can you help me or like this doesn't look quite right and so it was just like just a dream to be able to work with people of that of that caliber and I'm just really thankful that I got um got that, that opportunity yeah it's no secret that I mean a lot of people look up to Jorge and, are, and like yeah, what it how do you even get to that level and I, I think he released something here recently it was like his first demo reel and it was actually really encouraging for me uh, because yeah. I was like that's good but it's not great you know right. it's like it's, that really doesn't look like somewhere. Jorge's piece you know like what he would make but it's like where he starts you know and stuff yeah. like that and so but like to see the level of work like especially like what we're watching is like yeah. 
to where he is Jorge now. did all this. Yeah, this is uh, I think all those bubbles they were at C four D. Yeah, so like, the challenge of this was like trying to explain. And I wasn't involved in the script or anything. Ironically, I was a theology major. So if anything, on paper, that's what I should have been involved in. <laughs> but um, so a guy named Yuki Yamada did all the designs for this. Um, and so before we started, uh, Jorge just kind of threw all the shots in a Google Doc and was like, pick whatever looks interesting. And so I was immediately like, I want to pick all the ones that look cool. <laughs> uh, I was like sitting in the back of a van driving home from a backpacking trip like on my phone. I was like, I'm not like necessarily I want to pick the cool ones, but also like I want to pick ones that are going to challenge me and like be complex. And, you know, if I'm going to have these people with me that I can lean on for help, like I want to pick stuff that's really going to push me. Yeah. Um, so this this was like the beginning of, of one of the shots I did. So like this was like a style frame, and I mean just like that just looks <laughs> so attractive. Yeah. Um, and I think when you're when you're working with design, that's really awesome. I think it sort of forces you to kick up like you want your animation to be faithful to that, and you want to like kick up your game a little bit. Um, so yeah, I don't really know how I mean this like. This was uh, this was my favorite bit here, I think, um, and I think what was so neat was like I, um, you know, there was like the the very ending bit was, um, you know, that that was kind of like the frame, and then before that there was like a sketched version of maybe this, and then before that it was, I think like this or something so you you all this geometry you animated Mm -hmm. to to kind of live within that and to grow uh into uh what is this ending frame here yeah um grow into this it's like representing the world okay okay and and jorge was like he just said you know this is a shot i really i really want this to stand out so like feel free to put some time into it and Mm -hmm. you know really sink some time into it so that was like it was fun to just have that I just like appreciated having that like sort of the green light to really like spend some I mean I think I spent a couple of days honestly um and then I actually did a, a shot with a similar like world shape later on and sort of completely redid like just to give you an idea of how inefficient I can be sometimes so like each one of these lines is its own shape layer with that uh <laughs> maintain scale well parented expression okay which if you're not familiar like it basically you can parent something to a null, and then if you scale that null up and down, it kind of inverts the scale, so it the size remains consistent. So you can like take a bunch of dots that are all kind of like around the middle of something, and then if you scale that null up and down with those dots having that expression, they just like move from the center. Yeah, um, that's that's super helpful. I feel like I hear like uh, especially on our School of Motion alumni channel, like we I hear like all the time like, hey, how can I get this stroke to stop yeah. scaling? Yeah. you know, and so yeah. So same idea. Um, but it was just like what made sense in the moment. So, I mean, just like, first off, having, you know, I don't know how many layers this is, but like, that's a ton of layers, all having a kind of big expression on them. So mm. it was like very render heavy in a way that it, it didn't need to be, you know, these all these like kind of, I don't, I don't know what the term is, but these other ones, like that was a shape layers with repeaters but like i just wanted this to feel really complex so each of these circles has its own gradient stroke so that you know it's not all they're not all shaded exactly the same Mm. they're all black and white and then i actually um you know i had a bunch of different gradients to work with that yuki had designed so i actually made this like simple like linear gradient that had the points wiggling that was black and white and then i just tinted it to be like pre oh. it and tinted it to be different colors nice that's a really i feel like it's a really efficient way to work especially if like if these colors didn't work yeah. you know that's that's just one of those little smart yeah, thought t- processes t- yeah that's awesome one of the few that i did on this um you know so like these lines have a slightly different uh Grady, you know, this is like more red and this circle is a little different than that circle. And so I think like, again, these are all things that most people aren't going to stop and like, oh, I, I noticed that this color is different. But I think that the whole, this unit as a whole just feels more complex because there's more detail. And, you know, for like one bit, um, you know, here like I, I duplicated these circles and blurred the edges a little bit so there's just a tiny bit of shading yeah. that almost is like a shadow and it, again like 
who cares if anyone notices, but going back to like it's, a, it's the feeling. Yeah, it. it's the feel of like this is there's more or like you've especially noticed that here. I think we're like the edge of this these like straight lines is a little like more gradiented. Um, I feel like as I started to be a motion designer professionally, uh, sacred geometry was like a super yeah. popular thing. I feel yeah. like I haven't seen it a lot lately. And like to see this, it kind of like almost like <laughs> I say nostalgic, you know, I haven't been in the industry that long, but like it's really cool to see that. And I feel like it's really done in a, um, the the cheapest word I have in my mind is premium way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a yeah. premium. No, but, um, but man, that pulls it off so, yeah. so well. And this is this is an example where I, I really leaned into Jorge and Victor a lot because, mm. um, you know, my first couple of passes at this, uh, it kind of like there's a couple extra frames before it started moving, and so just being able to invite them over and be like, hey, like this, it just doesn't feel right. I can't maybe articulate why. I can sort of point like this area maybe, mm. Mm. Um, and so having their suggestions of well, you know, I think it just needs to move right away, so it feels more like and you're looking at it on a frame by frame level, but then when you zoom back, you know, that just feels better than it did before. Um, you know, one other example of something I learned here was that originally, so these are all shape layers with particular trails, but I had originally keyframed, you know, four different dots and was having to just like edit stuff and edit stuff. And it was a huge pain in the butt because, you know, you're, it's four layers and the paths are all different and then I it just struck me like why don't I just pre-comp one of one of these and then <laughs> rotate it four times from this and I was like oh, oh that makes God. me more sense <laughs> it's like oh that would have saved me hours um you know and this is kind of I mean again like another like little detail is that uh so these stars are made with trap code form and um because the script is talking about the world being created and I think conceptually really wanting it to feel like this this dot, which is representing God's wisdom, is doing the motion, like kicking all this stuff off. So you know, like having the rotation of this thing in the middle be offset a couple frames behind the movement of this dot. So okay. it's like it's subtly like they're not moving exactly at the same time, but one is moving and the other one's following it. Kind of just like, I guess, like hierarchy of meaning, like this dot is the main thing. Um, but then also I had a light parented to this that is bringing on all these, um, like the stars so that, you know, if you watch through this, like really closely, um, yeah. you can see like it's, they're generally kind of expanding out with the motion of that. And again, like, kind of makes it like, it feel yeah. like, it feels like it's coming alive yeah. in a sense. Yeah. And it's interesting because like, I feel like, uh, and people can really apply this like across the across the board you know whether they're doing something for you know that has a theological uh, yeah. basis or anything like if you have a story and you have a drive uh, like a driving character or, or a component to it you can really make it start to influence other decisions yeah. and stuff like that and so yeah. uh, that's that's really cool like that you pointed that out because I I I felt it come alive like yeah. the frame uh, or these uh, this segment and stuff like that, but like now knowing it makes me appreciate it even yeah. more. You know, of course, you can't always explain that to your right. audience or anything like right. that. But but yeah, and I think like that just goes to like I think the techniques and the fundamentals are also worth learning. But I think if you don't apply them conceptually, it's sort of like I don't know. <laughs> it becomes like um, you know, here's how to replicate this effect in After Effects, not like here's what you can do with it, and mm. so you know, stopping and thinking, okay, I really want this to feel like X. Like I want it to feel like this dot is making all these other things come alive. And you know, that's the direction I've received. That's the feedback I've gotten. Like that's, that's what the goal of this is. How do I take all these things I've learned, like eye trace and overshoot and easing and like apply it to this so that it does that. And I think if you don't, if you learn like, oh, I can do this glitch effect with fractal noise, that's great. But you're learning how to do a like copy someone else's work mm. and I think we all mm. start there that was how I started yeah. but if you don't just like practice having a, a goal and a thing you want to communicate and then taking some of those techniques and applying them to those things like I think that um, your work really suffers and I think I you know I've been surrounded by people throughout my career who have really I wouldn't have chosen that for myself I was like what got me into this was like oh that's cool I can how do you do that that, that looks cool but having people like yeah especially at open book who are always pushing me to think like what are you communicating with this mm -hmm. um i think has really helped me develop a passion for like 
creating work that connects with people and doesn't just look cool. So you've already talked a little bit about like you were stuck on a, a segment and then you went to Jorge yeah. uh, and uh, Victor yeah. and um, Victor, Silva. <clears throat> Victor Silva and you were like, hey, I'm stuck on here. What's it like? Uh, you know, because again, like we talked about earlier, like they're kind of giants yeah. in our industry. What's it like working with somebody that you can go pick their brain on something that you're working on for them? Like, is there, uh, I'm sure imposter syndrome is probably running rampant, you yeah. know, inside of your mind, but like. Uh, oh, yeah. Was it like also like was there any easiness to it or was it like better than you thought it would be or it was so easy I mean I think like something I just respect about people like Jorge and Victor is that yeah like they have they've done amazing work but they're the most like kind people I think I sort of just sort of like assumed that if you're really good at what you do you're kind of you know full of yourself and I don't think that has to be true uh, I hope that's never mm. true of me. Um, but it was just so, like, it was not like a, oh, I, I guess I'll come look at your thing. Or, like, I don't have time. Do you know who I am? <laughs> There's like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, like, maybe give me a couple minutes or I can't do that right now. But um, I think I always, maybe this is just me, but I sort of, like, feel a sense of shame in having to ask for help at all. Mm. And I think especially working on, like, this is, like, a big thing. I'm really excited to be working on this. I want to contribute. There's all this sort of, like, internal monologue that I think every artist probably deals with of, like, yeah, I guess just like shame. Like I, I feel like I should have figured this out already or I shouldn't need help. Um, but I also think like even back to the cross thing, like other people have ideas that are better than mine uh, and the best idea should win. And that's hard. That's really hard for me because I want my idea to be the best idea. Yeah. But um, I think, and even just seeing them, like that whole like bubbly thing at the beginning, it was called like the God space. Um, Jorge spent, I think like three days or four days making that in After Effects, and it just didn't work. Um, and so he threw it out and started over in C4D. Man. And just seeing, like, not only is that okay, but that's, like, the right thing to do for the project is to, like, not think, be so precious about your work that, uh, or, you know, your contribution or your input that you lose sight of, like, the big picture. Um, and so I think it was just really encouraging and, like, helpful for me to see that exemplified um and there's a there's a shot that victor worked on um later on here um so i did through i mean i can before i get there but um yeah so this is like the rest of my my bit here um yeah it's just kind of fun like bringing all these little things to i feel like uh, i love all the colors blending uh in, in between each other especially this dot yeah. That keeps popping up here. Um, so this is Jorge now. But, okay, um, great, yeah. Yeah, but it was fun. I mean, like, we we were trying to... These are all, like, particular emitters, and we were all trying to figure out, like, um, how do we get three waves to merge into one? Mm -hmm. And so, like, Jorge asked for help. Like, it's, you know... Um, we're all... Like, he's human. We're all human. Um, so that was fun. Like, I, I don't remember exactly how we figured it out, but it was, you know, each of these is kind of on a null that's moving up and down and parented all three of those nulls to one null that just scales down. So they all like, it was a pretty simple solution, uh. but I think sometimes finding the simple thing is the hard thing. Yeah, so this is a sequence that Victor did, which is yeah, <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's this, like, so this kind of shape is representing the spirit and I'm trying to remember all the different things we were trying to solve for, but it was having the dot spacing remain consistent as it's expanding out. Um, you know, so like little dots are getting added in, but they're also like, they're pulsing and waving like as a, as a unit. And then also they had to connect into this line to kind of mm. reveal mm. this, this mm. God space. And I don't even know how many, we kind of like gave them a hard time about it. Um, because it like not like it took so long it was just a really complex thing to figure out and there's a very specific way that it needed to be animated so we'd always be like oh you have to redo it <laughs> but um i just really admired his like dedication and willingness to spend because this isn't a thing that looks necessarily incredibly complex but the amount of expressions and things that went into having to like have this went into it animating in the way that it did is like just incredible so victor you the man um the other bit that i did of this and some of this was like pretty like 
you know, so I did this and there isn't much happening. And there were just some parts where like the things that they were talking about in the script was so complex that you didn't want there to be a ton of things happening on screen. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. um, this is another sequence that had some challenging looking stuff in it. So I was excited to, to do this as well. Um, You know, so like waves and um, again, so this was a very similar like shape as to what I had done earlier. But this time I having learned like, Oh wow, the way I did it before was way inefficient and too many expressions. How did you make it more efficient? Yeah, it's a great question. So rather than having each line be its own layer, um, and then using expressions, I think I built this with maybe three layers, uh, shape layers and repeaters, and then just keyframe the, I think I like expression link the position of, you know, like if one of these lines is just repeated and then rotated, I just um, added like a slider control to affect how far it is from the center. And then the other three lines that make up like the four move in and out. And so, um, you know, I could have just uh, taken a grid and scaled it up and down, but um, I wanted there to be sort of layers of movement as it's coming in. So like mm-hmm. the diagonal ones are like, they all meet up, but, um, and then, you know, one thing Jorge wanted from this shot was that, um, cause it's talking about how like in the Bible, Jesus forgave people's sins, which was not something that any human had had the authority to do. And so to kind of line up with the voiceover, we wanted it to feel like this character in the middle is interacting with the world behind it and so like Mm -hmm. when it scales Mm -hmm. down the lines follow behind it and then as it's so just having like those different layers of movement yeah it's um, so subtle but like yeah yeah and I mean another fun thing is that each one of these lines has a gradient stroke on it with wiggling (laughs) and so that like there's movement within each line um and then this wave thing that was a a rig that Jorge made is really brilliant it seems like wiggle and fractal noise are the basis for every single oh. awesome thing in, in <laughs> after effect and it's so weird it's like every time i've ever watched the andrew kramer video yeah. copilot tutorial it's like all right we're going to show you how to make right. uh, you know what whatever and it's like yeah. first use fractal noise and you're like why fractal noise? so i'm going to create a solid yeah um <laughs> but i think too like it's one thing to know fractal noise exists uh, right like yeah. oh i didn't know <laughs> joke about using wave warp <laughs> just use a wave warp on it um or wave world <laughs> oh. like this kind of the, like funny effects that uh wave warp is really useful uh, i don't think i've ever used wave world but maybe someday um but it's one thing to know these effects exist right it's another thing to know like here's what you can make it do that maybe it wasn't intended to do mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so and it and in, it in com- combination with something else and that's where like yeah. I think it's what we're all staying in awe of Andrew Kramer is that like he takes four effects that you have like you would think no relation to it and then he's got a you know a fully blown planet you know right. and it's just like you just made that out of some shoestring and uh, you know where'd you even get the shoestring effect you know yeah, whatever yeah, you know <laughs> so yeah I think just and that's like why experimentation and you know not just like scrubbing through someone else's thing frame by frame and figuring like I think there's just like this obsession that I even have over like how did they do that. Uh, you know, like, what software did you make this in? Yeah. Uh, tutorial, please. Um, and I think that's, like, that's fine. But I also think that, like, if there's a little bit... I mean, I'll speak to my own motivation in that because I can't... I don't want to make blanket statements for other people. But, like, there's this bit of... Well, there's got to be some button that I click that just does that, right? Yeah. Like, did you use, you know, what plugin or, you know... And I think... I mean, a lot of, like some of this stuff is just like, it's just not sexy. Like the way I got this, and I would say not even is it like, is it not sexy? It's like maybe like silly, (laughs) like this, you know, this particle trail to get it to form into this triangle was like kind of ridiculous to figure out because I had sort of Mm. created these like three triangles. Mm. These again, particular trails are being blown backwards in Z space like the like wind uh, negative z wind which is Jorge's idea um but i had to create all these position keyframes as linear and then pre-comp it and time remap it because otherwise the edges of the corners would or like the corners of the triangle will get curved okay because of how particular works mm. and so i had to make um this trail that comes in 
this like up through here that's one layer and now it's a different layer uh or at least like the dot is different and so <laughs> it was just a matter of like wiping off this trail <laughs> like oh, frame by frame man. with like a feathered mask yeah. until you know so now it's its own thing and it's going around in a in its little triangle but for the sake of like getting it right yeah, getting it to, you know, to merge and not just accepting like okay it's it's just rounded or whatever but like it's not like hey this is what it's supposed to be yeah. this is what we need it to be you like, know and like finding out a way yeah. it's like that's that's dot in one comp and now it's a dot in a different comp and then like the trails are just kind of blended together until you know here um and again, there's probably a way more efficient way to do that. I'm not saying this to be like, oh, look at how I did this. Like, yeah. it, there's probably a way better way to do it. But I think that like the bottom line of what I'm saying is there's just things that like affect an effect isn't going to do, and you have to really get creative about, um, yes, uh, like how how you stack things together that maybe we wouldn't stack. Um, and so yeah, I think like it's just it's really good to not just like Google things right away sometimes and yeah, um, just try and try different things and like beat your head against the desk until something works. And I think the frustrating thing is sometimes it's like a super <laughs> simple thing. Like, yeah. you know, if you like come up with this like really elaborate rig and then you realize, oh, I could have just done this really super simple thing and it would have done the same your thing. Your case in point earlier was the four dots that you turned into, like you just yeah. had, you know, turn into one. You're like, I could have just had one dot and then yeah, three times. Like, why am I changing keyframes on four layers and then using ease copy to make sure all the easing is exactly the same so they're moving at yeah. the same time? Like, if I wanted them to all move differently, then yeah. But, like, the point was for there to be symmetry. And so, like, why why have I been doing this for days? <laughs> yeah. And, but I think, like, it's, you shouldn't feel like, oh, I'm an idiot for not thinking of that. Like, it should be, like, oh, like, now there's a more efficient way I can do this next time. Like, that's just growing is getting better than where you're at yeah and so speaking of like growing and getting better where you're at like we we kind of had a little bit of a conversation before yeah. uh this and and you mentioned it earlier that like on your on your last piece the the help shift yeah um that you know this is one frame that like i feel like jorge wouldn't like you yeah. know whatever and so you, I didn't like it. <laughs> you would talk to me about like it wasn't like that the movement was wrong on yeah. every frame when you were working with uh jorge but it was like that this frame specifically yeah. didn't look good that he didn't like yeah. you know like the way it kind of laid out the design yeah. of it and that was really intriguing to me because i don't think that person i've ever gone through the process of picking apart every frame yeah. you know and that could be what makes it uh different between uh you know low mid and high level animators yeah. is that they pick apart each frame yeah and so like can you kind of talk about like what is that you know done for your process as far as like an animator or like what you view things uh kind of like yeah. him pointing that out yeah, I mean, it, it, it wasn't like, Jorge was not at all like some crazy art director, like, I hate this frame. It was just kind of like, but I, th I think it was just the fact that he cared so much about the piece to take that level of detail and to say, like, this like this one, I mean, first off, like, his attention to detail that, like, you notice one frame out of 24 in a second that yeah. doesn't look right. Um, I think, like, it just uh, it just made me, like, more excited about that level of like attention to detail because I think like those are like the non-sexy things that go into creating beautiful work um, and work that is really like top level mm -hmm. and you know just how I'm wired like I always want to get better and I want to keep like growing um, and so I think it was just sort of helpful to like get inside the head of someone who I really respect as a person and as an animator to see this is the amount of like time or like this amount of detail that you have to have to, to create these things. And so, um, yeah, it was just, I had never like had the experience of thinking on like a frame. I mean, frame by frame. Yeah. Like sometimes I like keyframe things on every frame, but just thinking like, does this frame look good? Does this frame, do we need this frame? Yeah. Um, and it was honestly like really freeing in a way too, just to think like, Oh, like, one, here's a very simple way that I can get better is just to look at every frame and think like, not so much like, is this attractive, but does this fit? Yeah. Uh, and so like that one frame in the health ship thing where the um, the dots were too small, is like, I could have just turned the dots off on that layer and had them come in on the next one. And, you know, then I wouldn't be bothered by that anymore. Yeah, man. 
that's interesting. You know, yeah. And so, like, again, cuts and, like, the small little yeah. detail tricks that we don't think are, like, the fanciest things, yeah. you know, as far as what we need to use to make, like, a beautiful motion piece. It's, like, those are sometimes the, the, the foundational pivot points, yeah. you know, for a piece. Yeah, totally. And I think, like, so much of good motion design is problem solving. And I think that's even, like, historically true with animation. I remember, I think it was an animator's survival kit. But I was reading how in some Looney Tunes scenes, like there's a scene where a character walks off stage and you hear these sounds of something being built and walks back on, like walks back into mm-hmm. frame with this contraption built. Mm-hmm. And to think like, I mean, there's probably a lot of conceptual story reasons to do that, but also simply like to animate them building a ladder or whatever. Uh, I think it was like a high diving board or something. I don't remember, but yeah. like would have been insanely complex but they walk off they walk off frame so you don't even have to animate it you hear sounds you know something's being built and they walk back on and you think oh they built that but like again i'm not going to call that lazy i just think that's incredibly smart yeah and so i think like from day 1 a lot of what's built into the nature of animation is working smart and working efficiently and um so i think that's something i'm still like really much trying to learn because i'm so detail oriented that i want like I would want to animate the thing off screen anyways, just to say I did it. Yeah. Um, or just in case, you know, we need to, like, that's just my, and I don't think that's great. <laughs> I think it's a little silly, but um, just seeing that, like, problem solving is what's built into this mm. from, like, historically, that's just part of what it is. Like, yeah. you add a button in the 1940s when you're doing cell animation, and suddenly you have to add that button on every single frame. Someone's got to outline it. Someone's got to color mm. it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so you always have to, like, you've always had to be thinking about what does it cost to do this, or and is it worth it, and, you know, what are we trying to do? Um, so, yeah. so, like, uh, kind of, like, feeding off of what you're talking about, there's, you know, in cinema, there's, like, uh, and people might disagree with me, but I feel like we overuse effects sometimes to where, like, we want to show, you know, like, let's just say it's a gruesome scene and someone, like, gets shot, yeah. right? They would cut away, you know, like, someone, you would see the gun, and then boom, and then you hear the person fall. That person just shot that person, right. you know? But now it's, like... No, we want to show like every detail yeah. of it and stuff like that. But sometimes, like I would argue, that's not even like the best way to go about right. it. Yeah, yeah. I think like that's why putting in the work to have a concept. I mean, it's just like you have to have guiding principle. Like you have to have parameters around your project uh, for it to be like you have to be focused. And so having like this is the thing I am trying to communicate. And then when you're faced with those decisions, like well, you know, do I? do put in the work to build this thing or not it's like you can look at that i mean i used to put a post-it note and stick it on my monitor and be like you know this is like the goal for this project Uh, then you can say well does this help that no Mm. then don't Mm. do it Mm. like just don't (laughs) yeah uh because you'll save like you only have so much creative bandwidth per project i think in general um and so like do you want to expend a lot of that making something that like isn't going to work and sometimes you have to, to to find out like how something is going to work but um yeah i just think like having like a focus and a goal always in your mind helps make some of those decisions um it almost like i feel like we should have like a challenge almost of like communicated not shown yeah. in a sense and like to really like i don't think it's a muscle we flex often is like how can we communicate it that this thing happened and not show that right. that thing happened yeah. you know um and, and that could be longer pauses yeah, on a screen. You totally. know, I, I think uh, when you think about old uh, cinema, like the, the, the shots would stay on someone's face longer so you could see them go from like disgust to realization that, right. you know, they're in the wrong or something right. like that, yeah. you know, and like that process of being able to walk through as, as an audience member or is it just as a human being? Because we talked about earlier, like the eye, like people yeah. notice the details. And yeah. so they get to make that connection themselves. And so let people make the connection themselves inside their motion piece. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's totally fine. Like, this is all communication anyways. And so it's not lazy to, it's not like a shortcut. You're just, you're making a wise decision based on the goal and the concept of your project. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, Greg, it's been awesome getting to walk through this piece, or all three of these pieces with you. I hope that, like, uh, this helps other people, like, kind of think about their process, you know, what is it, what kind of goes into it, how to communicate. I I think we covered a lot of really good stuff that, even personally, like, I feel like I learned a lot uh, in this process. And so, uh, man, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to kind of sit down and and run through these pieces. Yeah, no problem, man. It's been super sweet, and I'm really thankful for the opportunity and grateful to do what I do. If you want to learn more about Greg, head over to School of Motion. You can find a link in the description of this video. 
Thank you so much for watching and best of luck on all of your motion design projects.